So before I hand it over to Marsha, I wanted to say one quick thing. Uh, some of y'all have been asking about the podcast, a reminder that it will occur every two weeks. And so tomorrow or Tuesday, but most likely tomorrow, our second episode will launch. And that's actually me and Marsha. So you'll get a little taste of that today. Um, but that's all I have for you. So I'm going to turn it over to Marsha right now. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I feel like I'm here. Y'all, I'm going to have my head on the floor. Okay. Um, so this was probably the biggest challenge I've had in, in teaching, and so I dumped it all on you, if you've seen the notes. Um, let's start with a, a quick prayer. I forgot to write that down for y'all, but let's go to the Lord anyway. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your majesty. We thank you for just the way that you have spoken to your people through the ages. Help us now to understand a little bit more about you through these ancient words that you gave to your people, the Israelites. We want to know you better. And so open our minds and hearts to hear your words. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Put on your track shoes. Here we go. So the Pentateuch is actually uh, five books, and Leviticus is in the middle of it. Leviticus is heavily uh, tilted toward worship, and it may be trying to, uh, just by placement, say something about where worship should be in our life, central in our life. It's also a summons to righteousness, holiness, and justice. Uh, we get so bogged down in all the worship stuff that, that we sometimes miss the, um, the very important distinctions that have to do with justice for all people, that have to do with care for the earth. We'll talk about that later. Leviticus actually means about or relating to Levites. Levi was one of Jacob's 12 sons, uh, Jacob's other name, Israel. But truly, the Levites themselves are only mentioned once in the book, and that's all the way toward the end in chapter 25. Uh, just so you feel like you've gotten your little bit of, of Hebrew here, Leviticus sometimes is called Torah Kohani. Kohani. Um, the uh, Kohites were uh, one of the one of uh, the sub tribes under the um, uh, Levites under Levi as the uh, ancestor, and um, so if you're ever on Jeopardy, here you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, what yeah. the what's the modern name for the priest? Cohen. Anybody who's got a last name of Cohen somewhere had priests. Uh, they were from that family. I've got in your materials here uh, a chart that we'll pull up here in a minute. And it's like the genealogy of Levi. It looks like this. Looks like this, except for I now have some. This says unmute me, but I think yeah, that doesn't matter. Okay, the, um, it, it starts with Levi. Levi had three sons, Gershom, Kohath, Kohathite, Kohath, and Barari. We'll see them talked a lot about next week. Kohath had a son, Amram, and then he had three kids, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So the Kohathites, the priests, come from Aaron, right? And so if you ever wonder why in the New Testament talks about priests and Levites, the Levites are the others that are outside of that Aaron line. So the only priests are uh, the, the family of Aaron coming out of Kohath. I went on and gave you a couple other names of um, people that descended from Aaron, who you see later in the Bible uh, as high priests. The first two sons, we may uh, spend a little time on it uh, in chapter 10, 
they went and offered unauthorized fire. It doesn't tell me much about what that is, but unauthorized fire to the Lord and the, and the judge just immediately, and the judge, God, the ultimate judge, just ultimately burned them. Poof. So, you know, be careful if you want high office because high office has high responsibilities. So the third son, Eliezer, became, became the high priest. And in Numbers, we'll hear more about Eliezer and his son, Phineas. Okay, that's maybe too much, but the Levites then become, they become the janitors, the musicians, the teachers, and the, the guards of the tabernacle. They didn't have the glamour jobs. Tradition gives the first five books of the Bible authorship to Moses. Um, Probably today, the majority of scriptures, uh, of scholars say, no, it probably wasn't Moses. It was orally carried down from Moses and then written probably during and after the Babylonian exile. But 36 times in this book, it says either God said to Moses or the Lord said to Moses. So the strong message is these were messages from God. Okay, where are we? We're at the foot of Mount Sinai. They've just had the law given to them. They built a tabernacle according to God's instructions. And now we're going to the promised land. Let's go. It's kind of like when you you have your kids in there wanting you get ready for vacation. Let's go. And then, wait a minute, God says, you need to know how to live. I got some instructions for you. And so he starts. The main theme here is in chapter 19, verse 2. He says, you must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. His underlying presence is he's there in the tabernacle, which is right in the middle of the people. And I've already got some of next week's handouts for you. And I'll show you how they camped around the tabernacle. He literally was in the center of the people. And when they moved, he was in the center of the march. I have another handout for you on how they lined up for the march. So, so we're talking about at all times, Israelites are to preserve, protect, and care for the tabernacle. That's where God lived in their midst. You know, they had, because of that visible tabernacle, a constant presence of God being with them. We're told that God's spirit lives in us. And maybe if we thought about that more, I do let fewer of the things that we do or more of the things we don't do. But that presence is a little harder to uh, recognize because we don't see it. They had it right there visibly in their middle. Um, another Le Leviticus uh, theme is that God is the Lord of creation. He built everything, he made everything, and it was all good. And that worship was the primary means to restore what sin fractured in um, creation. And so uh, God wanted that beautiful, perfect world to continue. The, uh, the whole, there's a holiness code in chapter 17 we may or may not get to, but um, that lifts up justice as a, a commitment uh, for Israel and uh, righteousness and the, the requirement to hold the land, God's creation, in trust for God. And we maybe haven't done the world's greatest job with that trust as a people. Anyway, there are only, there are only uh, really one big narrative, and I've kind of already given you that clue when the Aaron's sons got killed. Pretty much everything else is rules and that come forth in speeches from God. 36 of them. Magic number three times 12, right? 36 speeches from God in there. Um, most Christians have a tough time reading it. It's a lot about sacrifices and priests and a tabernacle, which followed by the temple. But we don't have any of those today. So why not just skip through its painful reading anyway? But... The sacrificial system was key in every ancient, pretty much, uh, Near Eastern 
uh, place, but it, it's different and it's particularly key here. So as a clue, the first part of Leviticus is going to be priests, sacrifices, worship. The rest of the book is going to focus on the daily behavior for Jews to follow, Israelites to follow uh, in their uh, living out of, of their lives. So, worship. Here we go. Couldn't wait for the promised land. God's going to establish the rituals now. Uh, and if we look at Leviticus, now I've got another handy dandy chart. Uh, looks like this. We'll put it on the screen. Um, Leviticus 1, verse 3 through 6, chapter 6, verse 7. You'll see five major offerings. And um, these chapters deal with the offerings from the side of the donor. And then you go, and, the, and those, you're, at least for me, I shouldn't put me on to you. But at least for me, my eyes, start, as I read it, my eyes start rolling back and I'm kind of, what in the world? But um, then if that's not bad enough, you get to chapters seven and eight, uh, the rest of six and seven. And those are pretty much the same rituals from the viewpoint of the priest. So if you start wading in and you think, wait a minute, I just read something like that. That's that's what's happening. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot more time. I've given you my handy dandy chart on the specifics. But one of the things that has struck me is the first three offerings, the burnt offering, the cereal offering, and the peace or fellowship offering, which is also often called, oh, here we go, the well-being peace or fellowship offering. Um, those three were voluntary offerings. Now, one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to confess is that hit me through this is, you know, we think, let's just say, I think I'm doing good when I give a tithe to the church, right? That's what I'm supposed to do. Well, they were required to give a tithe. That's just kind of off the top out of, you know, the one tenth. And that's what kept the sanctuary and the priests and the Levites that was their compensation. That's kind of what we pay. But these first three offerings were voluntary offerings that were to be given, given above and beyond that. So when we think we're doing good by giving the tithe, we're doing kind of what's necessary to keep the place running. These were given not out of duty. They were voluntary People gave them out of love and gratefulness for God. There are times when, like with the bird offering, pretty much the whole thing was burned up, uh, except the hide, which went to the priest. There were others which the best part went to God, and then uh, the well-being offering, and then they had like a big party, and the worshiper and uh, the worshiper's family and friends and the priest all had a big dinner out in the courtyard of the tabernacle. But you've got to think about these being subsistence kind of people. They had animals, and to sacrifice a perfect bull was a big cost. One of my authors said it was like if you took a stack of $100 bills into John and said, would you burn these up for me out of my gratitude for God? Well, I haven't seen a lot of people doing that here. Um, nor would we really want to. But, but that's what they did. They took one of their most valuable commodities and gave that to God out of this sense of gratefulness. And that probably is something that it wouldn't hurt us to, to recapture a little bit. I, yeah, you're supposed to do that. What else shows, God, how grateful you are? Marsha, yeah. real quick. Yeah. At the time, it's like your first fruits. So, that was your first fruits. You know, it's your it's it's the first cut. A absolutely. Before you take, you know, count up everything before, and see yeah. what you have left. Yeah, right. The very first thing, but it was the first ten. And remember, Leviticus, uh, we'll get to it maybe, but Leviticus also required that you leave some of the crop there in the field. 
Remember Ruth? She was out getting that stuff. So he got the first cut, and then the people, the poor, or the resident alien, got kind of the last cut. So, and he only got to work six days out of seven, and then six years out of seven. So God was always there. I'm sure we'd have some people you'd go to see, and he'd say, God's always in my pocket. <laughs> because in in many ways that happened. Okay, so what let's talk about what the donor did for a minute. The donor would come and he'd bring most of these are animal sacrifices. Obviously, the cereal or grain offering is from this the, you know, the fruits of the field. Bring the animal, and I've mentioned in the notes the kinds of animals for each offering. And uh, he comes to the tabernacle. The tabernacle, there's a courtyard. You can bring it in the courtyard. The tabernacle itself, the tent of meeting, is God's place. So he comes to the door of that, and there's a priest in there. That's the place where man and God meet, right there at that door. And he comes and brings the animal, and he put the key, because we're talking guys here. He puts his hands on the uh, forehead of the animal, and that was this. You know, a symbol of transferring your sins to the animal. Probably your family gets counted in there. And then he slaughters the animal. Yeah. Tim Marsha, just a question. Uh, in, we know in the Hellenistic world, when the village had a, a sacrifice, it was a feast for the entire village. Yeah. That it wasn't just a, a located in the temple. But uh, you know that there's a sacrifice coming up, and your family, as every family in the village, the is part. going to have part of it. Uh, and, and so it's a combination of religious plus civic celebration. Um, in your research, uh, is that motif also found here, Leviticus, yeah. that it's a community celebration? Not in these, no. Yeah, because I don't recall that, that. The closest you should get is a sacrifice of well-being. Where, uh, because bird offering is completely burned up, and we'll get to the the two mandatory ones. But yeah. uh, the, the the sacrifice of well-being, the the worshiper, their family, and maybe a few friends and the priest would eat together in the courtyard yeah. after that. But that's very different from what you yeah, described. Yeah, uh, but no. but their sacrifices, God intended for them to be different than the the people around them. Yeah. Now. Uh, but didn't the priest and uh, those that were working in the temple, didn't they benefit from these sacrifices? So, uh, yes, we'll get to that. Yeah, Certainly, yeah. and I've got this in my notes. We, we'd spent forever going chapter and verse through these. That's why I made my little grid. The cereal offering, the guy got the first part, and the priest got the rest. Yeah. So you have different levels of offerings and different benefits. Um, but I'm going to, uh, anyway, let me finish. Real quick, that he put his hands on the animal's head, transferred his sin to the animal. Then the worshiper, not the priest, I didn't realize that until I got into this, was the one that killed the animal. Slit his throat um, and saved the blood. He takes the blood, which God says in Leviticus, blood is life, it's the animating fact, force of life. Takes the blood to the priest who puts it on the sacrifice altar. Um, but it brought home to the worshiper how precious life is. We don't, and one of my books is funny, we don't see animals sacrificed. We go to Publix. Right. And we buy them shrink wrap and, you know, whatever. Um, so but they always, I was going to say, they always knew the preciousness of life. We give thanks to Publix or if we're lucky, Burks. But they they had a completely different view, and I think most people raised on farms. I'm seeing the lay there. Maybe and most people raised on farms have that closer affinity with life. The animals facing toward the temple, toward God, when he slits its throat. Um, after that, the donor has to skin and quarter the animal, wash off the legs and the entrails. All impurities come off. And only then does he give it to the priest who has stoked the fire and is ready to burn it. 
So I'm going to skip over to the two mandatory offerings. And those are the uh, purification, our sin offering, and um, the uh, restitution um, offering, sometimes called the restoration offering. Sin was never casually treated by God. Our, our society treats sin kind of casually. But it was never, tr never treated um, casually by God. Leviticus believes that sin was so serious, it was like a, a virus or an acid to spread through society. It was not just my sin and I deal with it. Um, we have such an individualistic society and it's kind of gotten more that way since COVID, right? But um, for them, when sin would taint everything, and a lot of times when you stop and think about it, when you do something wrong, it's not just about you because other people are affected. I think uh, girls always grew up with that uh, game of gossip and you start one gossip and the rumor goes around and a lot of people are badly hurt. Look at the internet right now. So, so our actions do affect others, but sometimes we forget about it. Um, with um, the Jewish people, the, they were very aware that sin tainted everything around it, even the tabernacle. One author I read said, life without consciousness of sin's burden is pointless narcissism. Narcissism, I can have a word problem with that, posing as success and happiness. And we look at, I'm not going to pick on your football players, but athletes, uh, movie stars, you know, Sin is something they, you know, so I don't know about the, the football players, but I know that there is a culture where sin is, sin is, is uh, you know, it, it's my problem, it's not anybody else's, and it poses as a, as a culture of success and happiness. Okay, but sin's corruption moves on to others, and it polluted the tabernacle. So... When my sin offering is offered for my sin, the blood of purification from the animal that's sacrificed is put on the sides of the altar of sacrifice to purify what my sin has done to the community and even the tabernacle. If it was the whole community or the high priest who sinned, the high priest can go into the holy place. So it pollutes the holy place also. And so they go in and sprinkle blood, that blood seven times on the altar of incense that's different from the altar of sacrifice, altar of sacrifice in the courtyard, altar of incense in the holy place, and also on the veil between the holy of holies and the holy place. And if it is unrepentant sin, the only possibility is Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement, where the blood is put on the Ark. Okay, so these uh, these chapters, uh, I hope that helps you if you decide to wade through them. You can look at the chart, or you can say, oh, I've got the chart. I don't need to read those. We'll move on. I'm not giving permission, Coach. Um, okay, chapters 8 and 9, as I say, very similar, but they're doing the same sacrifices from the priest's viewpoint. What do the priests have to do? Then we go to the ordination of Moses, and uh, Moses ordains Aaron and his sons. I'm not going to get too much onto that. Some of the same things happen. But interestingly, after they're ordained, um, Aaron and his sons are told they have to stay in the temple there at the, you know, right there at the door uh, for seven days. Well, one of my books suggested that that's uh, Kind of like, well, if they'd gone outside, they would have gotten unclean, you know, very quickly. But one of the things I liked was it's a picture of creation. Seven days for creation. God is starting a whole new thing. His whole worship, this whole priesthood, this is a new way to be with God. Marsha, which sheet are you on now? I am just flipping over to 10. Ten. Yeah. 
close to God. So let's say you've been feeling like you're in kind of a spiritual wilderness for a while, so you go off for a bull. And that smoke is something that's a pleasing aroma to God, and this allows you me to come close to God. So I think the word was kashrut. Is that right? Something like that? Okay. Well, it's in my notes somewhere. You'll find it. And it means you want to come close to God. Okay. We've just gotten Aaron and his sons. Remember, there are four of them because you've got the chart, so you know all these things. Gotten them all more day, and it looks like things are going pretty well. Well, within a gnat's eyelash of time, Aaron's oldest two sons, see, they've been changed by this ritual from being ordinary people to holy people. What does holy mean? Set apart. So they've been set apart. Well, what happens to some of us when we start to think we're a big deal? Well, we're... Special privilege. We, yeah, I, I'm, I'm such a big deal. I'm stuff, you know, blankety blank, you know. Well, sometimes it goes to your head, and you think you're a bigger deal than you really are. <laughs> Aaron's two oldest sons, a fellow named Nadab and... Um, his other one was named Abihu, and this is chapter 10. Right after their ordained, they think, this is cool. I can go places regular people can't because I'm holy now. And so they go in and they offer unauthorized fire to the Lord. Doesn't tell you what an unauthorized fire is, and it doesn't tell you whether, I always thought they went into the Holy of Holies, but it doesn't tell you that. It just said they did something God didn't authorize them to do. But it was fire. So what happened to them? Fire for fire. God immediately blessed them with God's fire. And they were dead. Moses called them two of his uh, brothers, our uncles, um, kids, Mishael and Elphan, Elzaphan. And he said, haul them out by their tunics. Because if you touch the dead body, what would happen? You'd be unclean. So now, if they'd been in the Holy of Holies, I don't know how they would have hauled them out. So maybe they were just in the holy place. But haul them out and um, take them outside of the camp and burn them. And he says, this is the toughest part, to Aaron and his brothers, you cannot mourn them. They kind of got what they deserved. It doesn't say that in Leviticus, but I, that's the implication I draw. He says, the rest of the community, the rest of the people can mourn them, but you can't. And then he gives them some rules about every time you go into the tabernacle, you've got to comb your hair, you've got to get cleaned up and look good. We don't worry so much about that, uh, those of us that go to connection anyway. You know, we, we just think we're doing good getting there. But the priests <laughs> had to get you know, polished up. This was important. Um, and uh, and so, all right, we figured out that what God is thinking is these little things about who offers what, when, and how, all this minutia is important. And if you don't follow it, that's important too. Okay, 11 through 15, that now we're starting on the rules for uh, daily life. There's cash root. It means their dietary kosher laws. The, um, you could not have uh, any blood in your meat. I like rare meat. I'm glad Jesus changed a few things. But um, they, they had to completely have the priest that initially every animal to be sacrificed or to be uh, slaughtered went to the priests. And they would draw the blood and the blood had to um, you didn't, you didn't eat that. And even today, 
Orthodox Jewish people and some conservatives will keep kosher, that's the cash root, um, and uh, will go and have, there's a whole cadre of priests, rabbis, who will um, sacrifice, slaughter the animals, take the blood. And so if you go to a, a kosher deli, this um, very particular ritual has been followed for all the food that you get there. I once had a client that was uh, uh, Orthodox, and we had a Dickens of a time when we come down for depositions or something, finding places for him to stay and food for him to eat, because we don't have a lot of that here. He's from Brooklyn, and they have plenty of it. Anyway, reading through those four chapters will give you an idea of how much God cared about every aspect of his people's life. And I don't think that's changed. It's not like there are parts of our lives that are too boring for him and he doesn't care. He still cares about every aspect of our lives. And this nit and detail in all these laws, while boring to look at, strikes home that proposition. Chapter 16 is about the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. I blessed you by not giving you everything I know about Yom Kippur. We, we went through it in some detail in Hebrews. And uh, so it is a, the highest holy day in the Jewish faith. It is a day of self-denial, fasting, and repentance. You get to 17, and that's the holiness code. And what God was trying to say is there really should be no distinction in your mind between work and worship. You don't put on the good you to go to worship and then be the real you the rest of the time. It matters all, he matters all the time. And he goes on to say, there's no difference between the, the way you should treat the Israelite and the resident alien. You mean immigrants? Yeah, immigrants. Um, okay, the, the uh, Holiness Code also has a, an awful lot of rules um, that, uh, you know, that the animals, you didn't drink the blood, you, your blood was life. Um, and so I, I've gone back to what I've already talked to you about. 18 more rules, um, these particularly uh, setting apart and saying you must be different from the Canaanites and their sexual practices. You have to be a separate, different people. Um, all aspects of life were to be holy. So 12, 19 and 20 look like the Big Ten all over again, the original commandments. Um, but they're in a little different order. There are a little bit, there are a few more things in there. They're a little bit more specific. But they're challenging people to love each other and to do justice. He wants his love to be lived out and demonstrated in this holy community. We know we can see what God's like when we look at Jesus. But he's wanting the people of the world to see what God's like in his people. And guess what? God still wants that from his people today, from us. When people look at our lives, do they see God? I'll leave that for each of us to answer for ourselves. Um, you may not know where the command to love your neighbor is as yourself. It's in good old chapter 19, verse 18. You thought it was the big tip, but it's right there in chapter 19. It's part of the same thing we're talking about, right? It's being uh, living out God's life here. And what does he do? He loves everybody. Even the people that maybe aren't so nice. Um, the the uh, command about um, be holy for I the Lord your God am holy is also in uh, 19. It's verse 2, chapter 19. Um, it's been some of the uh, early uh, theologians. Um, who was it that wrote in, in Matatio Dei? Come on, Will, you know this one. Was that a, it wasn't Aquinas, it was Augustine. Augustine, one of those guys. 
I wrote the, the whole thing, imitatio dei, which means imitate God, right? And that's I don't know what he wants from us. Oh, Kempis. There you go. I knew it was I knew it was a Thomas. Who was that? Okay, Thomas Kempis. That's exactly oh, right. Thomas that's Kempis. his book. Yeah. Um, okay. So God wanted extravagant worship. Giving up a bull or a ram or a lamb was extravagant to these subsistence people. In this in this sanctuary, extravagant worship and overflowing justice and righteousness outside of it. Okay. Um, remember also, I think somebody said something about it. In addition to the tithe, you had to give the firstborn to God. The firstborn animal, of course, was slaughtered and offered to God. The firstborn child, fortunately, was not. In fact, in Leviticus, there's a specific prohibition against child um, sacrifice. But um, basically, the child was basically offered to God and then redeemed, paid for with a sacrifice, uh, depending on your network. You know, today, in all kinds of synagogues, uh, they don't have the tithe, but to be a member of XYZ synagogue, they levy a, a fee. Like you want to belong to Gasparilla, you pay a fee. You want and and the the board says what your fee is going to be. And of course, you don't want to tell your neighbors, well, I really don't make that much money. <laughs> so so if you want to be a member of the synagogue, you pay a fee. Um, and so I kind of look at the tithe as the fee. And then what you give is above and beyond that. Um, and here, above and beyond was also part of your fee, firstborn son, you redeem it with a grave society, an animal of some sort, generally, or a bird. Okay. Chapter 20 has some penalties for violation of the holiness code. I'm on 13. 21 and 22 are requirements for priests. And when you get to 23, you get to the holy days of the year. I have a handout. I didn't want them. Your, your uh, notes were too long, so I put them in a handout so the, so the notes don't go chapter and verse through all of the various holy days. But the most uh, significant one, setting aside Yom Kippur for different reasons, is the Sabbath. One day in every seven, you had to rest, to memorialize God's rest after his good creation. That was unique in the ancient world. People laugh at Jews because they took one day off. Is that was one day you could be making money. Right? Yeah. Well, even if it was just growing stuff, farmers work hard and you had to work double hard six days a week to make up for your day off. So they were they were really considered weird. They were set apart for God. Time, time is a non-renewable resource. And God's demand for one seventh of people's time was radical. Radical in that day. He also established um, annual appointed times to celebrate him. And so you get these um, things that I have here on this annual Jewish festivals. Uh, the first one is Passover, which also dovetailed the second day of Passover was their festival of first fruits. And also for eight days or seven days after Passover, you have the Festival of Unleavened Bread. They all kind of overlapped. Um, but that those you know about, these are the festivals of spring. The um, first fruits was the barley harvest, which was your first harvest. Wheat comes along later. So that those those are the first har the first uh, festivals of the year. Now you're gonna say to me, Marsha. I don't know much about Judaism, but I know that Rosh Hashanah is Jewish New Year. Why are you telling me these are the first festivals of the year? Well, it started out uh, with the spring festivals. Later on, to be more exact, Rosh Hashanah becomes the first uh, day of the spiritual year. 
because that starts the 10 days of repentance and self-assessment that leads up to Yom Kippur when you have the big self-denial and repentance. So it really makes sense, but it is confusing. And I've often wondered how could you have start with Passover at the spring harvest festivals and then say, you know, September, October is the first day of the year. Well, there you go. If you count up all the Sabbaths, you know, the seventh day Saturdays, and uh, the new moons, they always had uh, a new moon uh, worship service, and the annual feast, you get 70 days. 20% of each year was set aside to God, or you really didn't work. That's a lot of your time. That's a lot of your time. Um, and it was a testimony to the people around them, to their dedication to God. Okay. Chapter 24, page 15. How are, how are people going to know God was still with them? Yeah, there's the tabernacle, but... You know, and, and that okay, this would be nice if we had this. God told them that the lamp in the tabernacle, this is in chapter 24, um, which sometimes is called the tent of meeting and sometimes called the tent of the covenant, I think. So it's all the same place. Uh, was never to go out, even when the Israelites were on the move. So you knew by that light, and of course God is light, that God's always with me. And um, that is kind of what Hanukkah was all about. Antiochus Epiphanes, the evil, evil Syrian, had desecrated the temple. Judas Maccabee, and you can read that in first and second Maccabees, comes in, uh, beats old Antiochus, cleanses the temple, and they go to turn on the lamp. It's a menorah, eight branches. And what happened? There wasn't enough oil. And it was special oil. You had to brew it special, and it took time. They couldn't just do it overnight. There wasn't enough oil for the next eight days. Miraculously, God provided the oil. So that's Hanukkah. Um, the Jewish system of punishment, that's, you get in um, 24, 19, chapter 24, verses 19 through 20, uh, the eye for an eye. That maxim was actually limited punishment. Not most people, and, and you still, whenever you read or see history books, what do they want? Revenge. And it usually escalated. This guy, you know, cuts off your arm, you cut off their head, you know, then they come after your family, then you go after all their village. So God says punishment is to be limited and proportional. In fact, what we saw in, and I forgot to say this, about the restitution offering. You would offer the restitution offering. How much was it going to be? It was going to be the value of whatever you took or harmed, plus 20%, two times. So if I hit your car, I give you a car plus 20% of its value. You might be able to actually buy a new car, which is not what you get from insurance. So restitution was plugged into the Jewish code of what is how we live. We, like the, our predecessors, often are about revenge in our heart of hearts. We want the bad guys never to come out of jail. But if you know if they took you know two bucks or uh, like this, the candlesticks. You know, do we really want retribution? Okay, verse or chapter 25, the Sabbath and the Jubilee year. I already mentioned this a little bit. One year at seven, you were not supposed to plow or, or, um, or plant or harvest. If anything came up naturally from what was left over from grain that had maybe fallen on its own, you could take that but you were not supposed to do anything in terms of growing crops. What does that do for the land? Why, every seventh year, you get a year for the land to renew itself, replenish itself. God wanted his people to care for the land. God created it. It was good. Sometimes we set about messing it up. 
And so he built into this. Now, how much faith does it take for you not to plant for that seventh year? Kind of like not getting a 401k. Yeah. You know? How how do you how do you make sure that you're gonna be okay? I'm not suggesting that we don't do 401ks or any other kinds of savings. <laughs> yeah. I'm a banker's daughter. But um, this took huge faith. And in fact, I, I, a lot of historians aren't sure they ever really did it, really followed it. But God was given a principle to them. Take care of the land I gave you. You are a trustee, a steward. It ain't yours, really. Yeah. Yeah, Marcia, I just want to ask you uh, your opinion on all the reading you've done. On uh, verse uh, 22 in chapter 24, you just went over that. Uh, you shall have one standard for stranger and citizen alike. Right. All right. For I am the Lord your God. Right. Now, to me, in 2022, that just sounds very advanced. Right. And it's thinking, it's like, wow, this is really progressive and open minded. You're going to have one standard for the citizens and those who are strangers. And uh, it speaks of our common humanity. All right. Yet, earlier on in the book, uh, Leviticus goes to great lengths to say, you are holy, you must be apart from all of these other people around you. I, I guess, to me, maybe it's just me, it seems like inherently there's a conflict there, or a potential conflict, where on the one hand, I'm supposed to have only one rule for the citizens of Israel, for the strangers that are here, and we are part of God's common creature, creation. But on the other hand, I'm supposed to be separated from all the Canaanites. I, I, am I missing something? Or? You are supposed to be separated. Well, you're supposed to be separated from the Canaanites. What they're talking about, is, the, the key word is like resident alien. The people that come to live with them, think roots. You know, they come and adopt this land, these people, and so you aren't supposed to treat them different than your brothers and sisters. Um, in fact, in the Passover passages, which you can look over on your own, uh, any resident alien that chooses to observe the Passover must also observe it exactly as called for in the book. Yeah, that, that's our English word, stranger. That right, but, but they're talking about the rest of the day. Okay, well, that, that's that's when question. they go, we'll talk in numbers. What remind me? Right. There, there's a distinction they make in Exodus in the Passover direction between the foreigner and the resident alien or the sojourner. And the distinction right. is the foreigner who's there but not part of you yeah. and the resident alien. Was part of you. Yeah. You treat them the same. Yeah. And, and, and when they left Egypt, it said they left with a mixed company. Right. And you'll yeah. see when we get to numbers, um, there you have the various tribes going along, and then you kind of have I'm going to call them camp followers, and they're in the back, yeah. um, and sure. they're the people that are yeah. kind of following along. I would, I would just say, Marsha, from my point of view, it seems like there's a seed here for what Jesus Himself. Then talks about in the sense of he reaches out to the Samaritans, to the outsiders, the ones who are not in the inner group, and that Jesus uh, builds on that. Right. That I that I see as an inner tension there. Well, yeah. at this there's there's a difference in time and a difference right now. He's calling these people to be kind of a light to the world. Yeah. He calls us to be a light to the world too. I'm going to just finish. The Jubilee year was once in every 50 years. All debts had to be uh, forgiven. Well, that and the Sabbath year also. All slaves had to, all Jewish slaves had to be freed. And any land that had been sold to somebody else goes back to the original tribe and family. I don't know that that was ever followed. Either. That's pretty, uh, pretty demanding. Yeah. Um, or should the rabbis say no? Yeah. The, uh, the, for good reason, if they said yes. Um, the last chapter, 27, about vows and oath, is probably an appendix. But that's how you get to 36 speeches and, from God, and that's the magic number. 26, three themes I hold up. Avoid adultery, 
observe the Sabbath and revere the sanctuary because it's the place of God's uh, presence. Okay, hopefully you're not, uh, you didn't get to talk quite as much. It was a big book and it had a lot of stuff in it. And hopefully if you're planning to read this week, it'll help you a little bit wading through all of that Perfect. stuff. Thanks for all your research. Yeah. Thank you. Really good. It was fun. It's fun. Wow. Next week, numbers. That was full of stories, not just rules. It'll be more fun. Uh -huh. Great job, Marsha. Thank you so much. Okay. Where'd they go? I don't know. I see them on right here. They're up there. They disappeared on us. Well, there they are. They're here. Yeah. <coughs>